Okay, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the Foundation Day events of today. Uh, so I, in particular, I'm very happy to welcome all the, uh, not only the I members of ICTS, but many guests for our programs from other parts of Bangalore uh, and uh, so on. Uh, the Foundation Day uh, marks when ICTS is, uh, 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 the foundation for the ICTS was officially laid, uh, and it's actually now 10 years today. Uh, well, not today, uh, the 28th, uh, actually, technically speaking, but uh, 28th December is technically the uh, foundation day, and 2009, that was when the foundation was uh, laid. So we marked the 10th uh, anniversary of uh, the foundation, and it's a great pleasure and privilege to have uh, Dr. Shri Kumar Banerjee, about whom I will uh, I'll introduce uh, in, in uh, a few minutes. Uh, Dr. Shri Kumar Banerjee uh, give us the Foundation Day lecture today. Uh, we also have a cultural program and uh, dinner afterwards. Uh, so it will be a long evening of festivities. But um, uh, before we, uh, before I introduce Dr. Banerjee, I, I would like to call uh, Professor Spenta Wadia, the founding director, who uh, who uh, was of course uh, instrumental in that foundation and the foundation day uh, or in uh, ten years ago. So Spenta. So uh, welcome everybody, and thank you for being here. Uh, it, it seems much longer than 10 years ago, frankly. And uh, uh, I am a little bit uh, pressed for words to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what it was like when 10 years ago we laid the foundation stone of the institute. And uh, the foundation stone uh, ceremony was just one aspect. It was on the 28th, as Rajesh said. But uh, before the foundation stone ceremony, and after that, for three days, we had a, we had a meeting which was uh, titled Science Without Boundaries. And uh, we had people from all over the world come here. And uh, I was looking at uh, some of the lecturers, uh, Ajesh was there, and uh, even Ashwin Vishwanath was a lecturer. Forgotten that. So uh, it had. Uh, it, it was basically an event to sensitize the Indian and international science community about what we were envisaging in setting up this uh, center of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bangalore. And. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say too much except the fact that uh, the foundation stone laying ceremony uh, on the dais was uh, Sir Dr. Shrikumar Banerjee, he was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission at that time. And um, what really touched me that day about him is that before he came to the foundation stone laying ceremony, he actually visited this site to see what we have got and what we should be planning to do over here. So thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee, for doing that. Uh, then we had Professor Sienna Rao, uh, Professor David Gross, and Professor Mustansir Barma, the then Data Institute Director. And uh, we had the foundation stone uh, laid. And uh, you can see the foundation. So it's a metal plate, actually. It's not a stone, as you enter the institute. And uh, besides it, uh, there is another plaque actually called Foundation Stone Remarks by Professor Michael Atia, and uh, Professor Atia, who was uh, very, uh, in some sense, uh, quite involved in the setting up of this center uh, from our uh, institute in Mumbai, uh, was not able to come due to reasons of health, and he. Uh, he requested me to read out something which uh, I am presently going to do because I think it encapsulates the idea of the ICTS uh, in such a beautiful and succinct way that uh, 
every opportunity I have to, to recite it, I don't let it go. So here it is. So I very much regret not being with you for the laying of this foundation stone for the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, but I'm with you in spirit and send my best wishes for the future success of this important center. So, science has the noble aim of trying to understand the natural world in human terms, to make sense of what we see. This brief phrase encapsulates both theory and experiment. What we see in the broad sense covers experiment, and making sense is the task of theory. As the great French mathematician Henri Poincaré said, science is no more a collection of facts than a house is a collection of bricks. It requires a theory to hold it together. Theory needs a framework in which to develop, and as a mathematician, I believe that mathematics provides that unifying framework. As Galileo said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Galileo was thinking primarily of mechanics and astronomy, but increasingly, since his time, mathematics has provided the essential underpinning of ever-widening branches of science. As soon as a science moves from the qualitative to the quantitative, mathematics becomes indispensable. Not only does mathematics provide the technical tools that all sciences require by its very nature, it acts as a unifying principle, integrating the diverse aspects of nature into an organic whole. I'm sure that mathematics in all its various aspects will play an important part in the future activities of this center. In the complex world, with the enormous challenges that we face, from climate change to energy, from poverty to water shortages, science provides a bedrock on which we can build our future. I'm sure that this center will play its part in guiding both India and the wider world in the years ahead. And I think uh, in the 10 years that uh, went by, we have been living up to the expectations set out in this uh, foundation stone remarks by Professor Michael Atia. And uh, I think uh, with this, uh, I'd like to say that uh, I wish that Ten years later, <laughs> when we have this type of a, uh, when we have this type of a gathering, I hope that uh, ICTS would have. Uh, I want ICTS to become much bigger than what it is. After all, it's a. It's a when you plant, when you plant a seed and the plant grows well, you nurture it and nurture it till it becomes a full-blown tree, and uh, I think uh, I think we have to grow. We have to really grow and serve our country to the best. And you have a very good leader here who will take care of that for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Spenta. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, for the reminiscences, as well as uh, for those very inspiring words of Michael Atia. Uh, they are up there, as he said, on the on the uh, main entrance, for those of you who would like to see them again. So, uh, yes, we have walked a long journey uh, of 10 years, and this is only the beginning uh, of a longer journey. Uh, I was just re remembering uh, when you said about, uh, when you read out Athia's words, uh, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, uh, fitting that the present workshop that's happening is about the role of topology in uh, something very down to earth, uh, like condensed matter. It's a very nice bringing together of uh, the sentiments that uh, uh, Atiyah mentioned about mathematics playing a role in uh, 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 so many aspects of nature. So um, let me now. Uh, 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 introduce Dr. Srikumar Banerjee. As I said, and as you heard from Sventa, it's very appropriate that he is uh, the speaker here at this 10th uh, uh, anniversary, and uh, uh, he has had a, has been kind enough to come and spend a couple of days here and uh, see what that piece of land has become. And uh, we uh, we uh, that uh, is a. Uh, uh, the, the, it's, uh, it's inspiring to see that uh, he's uh, been so supportive of ICTS from the beginning. 
So uh, Dr. Srikumar Banerjee is a, a, a very distinguished scientist. He is uh, uh, currently the chancellor of the Homi Baba National Institute uh, in Mumbai, which is the umbrella organization for uh, ma many of the DAE uh, institutions. He served as the chairman of Atomic Energy Commission and the secretary to the government of India in the Department of Atomic Energy between 2009 and 12, in, including the period of this foundation of ICTS and its initial years. Uh, and uh, before that, he was the director of uh, the Baba Atomic Research uh, Center. Uh, he has served as the chancellor of the Central University of Kashmir, the, has been the chairman of the board of governors of the IIT Kharagpur, uh, and currently holds a distinguished visiting uh, professorship at uh, IIT Kharagpur as well as the uh, University of Delhi, uh, and he also uh, serves on the council of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, his major research contributions are in the areas of phase transformations in zirconium and titanium alloys, effect of radiation on order disorder transitions, and tailoring microstructure and texture of nuclear structural materials through thermomechanical processing. Uh, he has over 350 research papers and has co-authored a book on fa uh, titled Phase Transformation. Uh, so as uh, director of BRC, he also organized research on nuclear fuel, fuel cycle, design of innovative reactors, applications of radiation and isotope technology in agriculture, healthcare, food preservation, and industry. So he's currently engaged in research in advanced nuclear fuel cycle, policy for sustainable energy, and the metallurgy of actinides. Uh, he is, uh, as I said, very distinguished. He is a member of all the uh, science academies of India, for, as well as the uh, one for engineering, uh, and the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS. Uh, he has many awards, uh, including the SS Patnagar Award, the, the Humboldt Research Award, uh, the Padma Shri Distinguished Material Scientist of the Year, uh, the uh, Presidential Citation of the American Nuclear Society, the W.J. Kroll Medal of the ASTM, the Robert Kahn Award, and so on, and uh, has several uh, honorary doctorates from um, multiple universities and institutes. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Banerjee uh, to the newly to ICTS now built, and uh, he'll tell us about the BCC to hexagonal phase transition as an example of displacement ordering. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, just before we begin, I have a small ceremony. I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Rodham Narsima to hand over on behalf of ICTS a memento to, uh, uh, to Dr. Ban uh, and Dr. Banerjee. Professor Rodham Narsima has also been uh, a long time member of our International Advisory Board. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to have him uh, here today with us. Let me first thank uh, uh, Director Rajesh Gopakuma for the nice introduction and uh, spent a word here for a quotation which uh, he likes to repeat, as he says, number of times, and I think it is worth repeating. So again, I repeat a phrase that you said, make sense of what you see. It's there in your quotation. Well, I was a bit reluctant to give a talk in this August audience, and all, most of you are talking in, in the quantum level, whereas mine will be mostly classical. So in that uh, quantum kind of a framework, this may appear too trivial. So that was one worry. But that statement that making, what is science, that making sense of what you see, gave me the courage. So let me try that in explaining something which uh, may appear, uh, I would say, somewhat uh, trivial to you, but uh, let us see whether we make any sense out of this talk. Okay. 
I acknowledge my collaboration with uh, some of my students, some of my also colleagues from BRC, from University of North Texas, and so Ohio State University. Particularly Ohio State, where they have the very good electron microscope. And today's microscopes can literally see uh, not just atomic scale, but finer than the atomic scale. So I'll refer to that later. Let me come from fundamentals. I think most of you have forgotten this, that who gave the first definition of what is the order of a transformation? Ethan Face is the person. I don't remember the date. He did that, and this is the classical definition of the nth order transformation. That's how it is. Well, in the quantum, you are all talking of the higher order transformation. There's nothing of the first order type. All of, all of them are higher order. So here you can see that Gibbs function's derivative, the nth derivative, and the delta of that at constant pressure, if it is not equal to zero, and n minus one derivative is equal to zero, is defini definition for the nth order reaction. For n is equal to one, delta g is equal to zero. We all know that the Gibbs function becomes zero for two phases, which are in equilibrium. And the, the differential, which comes to minus delta s, which is nothing but the enthalpy of transformation divided by the transformation temperature is not equal to zero. Meaning that you have a latent heat of transformation, in simple words. This is nothing but the latent heat, and that is a non-zero quantity, whereas that becomes zero for the second order. There's no latent heat of transformation. And if you look at the Gibbs function, enthalpy, and Cp, in first order, you see there's a very distinct jump in the enthalpy and Cp. In case of second order, there's a kind of a continuity and so there's no real jump of enthalpy, so there's no change in that. This is a very classical uh, thermodynamic definition of, of the, today I think nobody talks of second order and third order, fourth order and all that. We only say that we are talking of either first order or higher order. Because higher order you don't have uh, this uh, basic difference the enthalpy change is not there in higher order. There is no latent heat of transformation. But the latent heat of transformation measurement is not an easy task. And many more often than not, particularly in many transformations, which has a very small latent heat, really working out that what is really the first order and what is not remains a basic doubt. Now I come to another parameter. This is again coming to the Landau description of the first and higher order. Again, these are all taught maybe, I don't remember in which level, but I didn't study physics, so must be done in, is it in the graduate level it is taught? So then uh, what uh, Landau did, Landau gave a description in terms of the order parameter that delta G will be a eta square and eta is the order parameter. Now, what is order parameter? That I think you all know. Here is the simplest definition of order parameter, where we are talking of an ordering, pure chemical ordering. And in pure chemical ordering, you can consider that these are the atoms, atom positions, where you can at random place A atom or B atom. And it is a, the average composition at every point. It's a kind of an average composition of those atoms that is there. There's complete disorder. There's no way of segregating them in the right place or the right sides. Now, when you talk of A and B atom, you can as well consider spin up and spin down. So that kind of ordering also will come. So it's not great difference between the descriptions which you are giving from the chemical sense or from the spin ordering. And then if you have a very specific occupation probability, occupation probability jumps from zero to one, and you have a very specific site, this site occupied by the red atom, next one is a green, next one is red, then you can call, call it a complete order. So it's a kind of an arbitrary parameter, which we define like this, and the whole process of transformation can be described in terms of this eta parameter, starting from zero to one. And Landau gave this description, which is again very, very well known in all physics uh, courses. The delta G is a eta square, eta cube, eta four, like that it goes on. Now, this is, of course, well known, but I don't think it is so much, uh, so much publicized that uh, Landau and Lipschitz, they gave some symmetry rules, which will actually tell that which are, which are the 
first order or which are the second order transformation, which qualify to be a second order transformation. Not that necessarily if these rules are followed, the transformation will be second order. But this only makes something to qualify to second order. The first rule is what? That the space group of the symmetry elements of the ordered structure must be a subgroup of the symmetry elements of the parent disordered structure. It's a very formal type of a description. Try to imagine it in terms of reality, in simple words. Imagine there's a lattice, and from that lattice, a completely new lattice is being created, which has no relationship in terms of the symmetry. A completely new symmetry, it's not a subset of the original symmetry elements of the parent lattice. Then this kind of a condition will not be fulfilled. It's like, you know, in chemistry, they have, uh, they distinguish the two type of transformation as a reconstructive and the other one is a displacive. What is reconstructive? You have a lattice, that lattice gets destroyed and a new lattice forms. That is reconstructive. There's no symmetry relationship between the two. Whereas in displacive, you start with a structure and without breaking the bonds, but displacing the bonds come to a new structure. That is displacive. But you know this in the subject of phase transition, which is covered in many subjects, whether in geology, in metallurgy material science, in physics and chemistry, conceptually there are a lot of similarities, but jargon-wise there's so much of difference that one cannot understand the other's language. But basically we're talking of the same point, so this is a very important uh, kind of a condition. Second condition is also very important, which says the wave vectors generating the ordered structure must minimize the harmonic portion of the free energy. This also is a formal definition. A little elaborate definition, not definition, description of that is that the wave vectors are there which actually transform one structure to the other. These wave vectors must terminate at special points of the Brillouin zone. Special points are those points in which symmetry elements intersect and it becomes a singularity. And at that position, if it terminates, then the system qualifies to fulfill the second condition. And the third condition is that it must not be possible to construct a third order invariant from members of the star of wave vectors satisfying the second criterion, this criterion. Star of the wave vector essentially means that in crystallography you have the multiplicity of a given direction. UVW has certain multiplicity. So there are multiple possibilities. And if these multiple possibilities, if you can construct, that is, to three different vectors, if you add it up and it ends up into a reciprocal lattice point or a, or a real lattice point of the parent structure, then again, it is not going to satisfy this. Coming kind of a, kind of a geometrical description of these. This also, I think, is, is known to most of you that the first order transition has, the, I have not drawn the other side. If you are going to the eta minus, that is anti of that structure, a second domain kind of a thing, the energy will go up like this. It's not a symmetric function. It's not an even function. So you have a situation like this. What, is, what does it mean? It means that if I have an order parameter as it goes increasing like this, and if you have an incremental change in the order parameter, infinitesimal change from the zero order parameter, then you see that it is the, order, the, the energy, energy is actually increasing. And there's a hump, and after crossing the hump, you come to the equilibrium order parameter, which is here. It has to jump that in case of first order. And that means the curvature of the G versus eta plot, second derivative, you always do that second derivative analysis, the curvature is positive at the, at the equilibrium temperature. So you have to jump this and come over to this. This is where you find the G value becomes equal. So this is possible that this state, this state will be in equilibrium with a state like this. So an order parameter eta C and order parameter zero will come in equilibrium condition. Something which is not emphasized again in majority of the textbooks will be that essentially means one very important physical fact. What is that? That is these two states, zero order and a finite order, these two states can remain in equilibrium, they can coexist. So coexistence of the two phases, parent and the product, 
is a very good signature of a first order transition. Now you try to imagine the issue because when you talk of quantum structures, you always refer the first order, all first order parameters or transformations, you group them as a solidification, liquid solid transformation. So not all are like that. There are many which are very bordering the first and second order. But I'll give one example of this omega which is like this. That's why I bring that point. So what is important is that two phases can remain in contact. Two phases are simultaneously present. They are coexistence. That's a very easy microscopic description and observer, observable, which can determine that whether it's the first or second order. Coming to the second order transition, I think I, I didn't show this. You are all familiar. First order, you expect like this, the order parameter to change. In second order, it is like this. And important point is that second order transition is what is happening. First of all, in this expression, you will find any odd uh, power of the eta, those terms are zero. That is, b is equal to zero, so eta cube term is not there, eta five term is not there, eta seven term, none of them will be there. Only even powers will be there. So at t higher than tc, we have a plot like this, harmonic type. t equal to tc, this curvature changes from positive, it becomes just zero. So you are entering into the unstable region. And at t below tc, this becomes negative. So you are changing the curvature at the point t is equal to zero, changing over from one state to the other. So this is instability driven transformation. Transmission is not possible, it's not by a jump of order parameter. Earlier case, as I showed, here you need to have a jump of the order parameter. And the jump of the order parameter has another meaning. If it has to be jumped, the system as a whole, can it jump an energy barrier all at a time to the new phase? It's impossible. So it does by doing it in minuscule area, a small point, which is a nucleus, a nucleate first, and then have create an interface. See, then you understand that the definition of phase, what was given, where we always say that it has an interface. Interface is the most important criterion of defining a phase. You will have a, the thermodynamic parameter which is constant within that, and there's an interface across that, there'll be a sharp drop. So that's the concept of interface. So when you have a situation like this, there'll be an interface between this and that. And that is what is there in the first order transition. In case of second order, that interface can never be there. Because system as a whole is changing from one to the other structure. Okay, so that's a very basic difference between the first and second order, which I wanted to emphasize. So what is happening here? If I examine it at is equal to zero, you have to change, see the curvature, which is the second derivative. Second derivative changing a sign from positive to negative. Concavity upwards to concavity downwards. So this is what is happening in second order transition. And it's instability driven. Any minor change, every smallest of the change in order parameter will drive it towards this point in the minimum. So it's not, there's no barrier, there's no nucleation barrier. It is not nucleating at one point and growing, but system as a whole is changing from one to the other structure. It is like this. You see this definition of metastable, stable, and unstable. Essentially, this is a gravitational potential, you can take anything, chemical potential, any other potential. In that potential, if you are here, it is unstable because any infinitesimal change in order parameter will shift it to this or that side. And in case of a metastable situation, it's not like that. It will uh, oscillate between that, but it will come back to this point. Okay. Again, I say little repetition. Continuous and discrete transformation. What is continuous? The system becomes unstable with respect to small fluctuation leading to the transition. That is continuous. Very small, infinitesimally small. And the free energy of the system continuously decreases with amplification of such fluctuations. And like, and usually, higher order transitions are continuous to, and the parent and the product phases cannot be sharply demarcated at any stage of the transition. Meaning that you can't identify the interface at any point of the transition. In place of discrete, Parent phase direct, discreetly transforms into the product phase, creating a localized sharp change in the thermodynamic properties and structure. And first order transitions are discrete, but there are possibilities that first order transition at sufficient supercooling can be made continuous. But we are not talking of those things. 
and sharp interfaces are present between parent and product phases. Then I come to omega. Is omega is something very peculiar? There is some peculiarity. Omega is actually an equilibrium phase in group four metals. I have given the example of titanium, zirconium, and hafnium. Later on, I'll see that how many more areas where we omega-like structure. And the phase diagram is temperature pressure phase diagram. And if you are at uh, ambient condition, then at certain pressure uh, from the alpha phase, which is the hexagonal close pack structure, it goes to omega, which is not hexagonal close pack, it's a hexagonal structure. I'll give the description in a moment. So that is the point where it goes over to omega alpha to omega. You can also get beta to omega at a different uh, temperature pressure regime. And this alpha to omega transition has a hysteresis. It's a first order transition. First order transition can as well have a hysteresis. And that hysteresis is shown by these two dashed lines. So this is the omega to alpha, this alpha to omega, two lines are there. And those uh, parameters are given. Typically, you can remember that this temp the P0 temperature at ambient in the range of about, uh, about two gigapascal in case of alpha to omega in titanium and zirconium. Hafnium, which is a higher melting point material, this is much larger, this is about 21 gigapascal. In fact, uh, in IIC Bangalore, a uh, uh, lot of work used to be done in the early days on, on this high pressure transition. And uh, on one side, and similarly on, uh, and you may be knowing also Dr. A. J. Raman. A. J. Raman also was very much, very strongly interested in the high pressure transition of alpha omega. And uh, there has been a huge amount of uh, scientific work that has been done in this line. Now I come to that, that there is a peculiarity. One side, you say that by putting high pressure, you can change from alpha to omega. Similarly, you have another way if you put more of uh, group five elements, group six elements into group four, that also promotes omega. Pressure requirement for reducing the, for the for transformation, you see, is getting dropped drastically. By, by, by just having vanadium addition in titanium, niobium addition in zirconium, niobium vanadium being on the group five. So as you're putting, so there are, there are ways of describing this in terms of 3D occupation, how much of 3D electrons are there. And they're put more by addition of the group five or group six elements, and that also reduces. And so this is, uh, now I come to the crystallography. Crystallography is that, BCC structure, you don't look at BCC structure like this, but you have to see it this way. We are looking at the 111 planes, and these 111 planes are stacked one above another. So this is the zeroth layer, first layer, second layer, and the third layer. So this is how it is. If you are looking at this, you'll find there's a uh, threefold symmetry, because al along 111 direction, there's a threefold symmetry in the BCC structure. And what is omega? Omega is nothing but that these two planes, in between plane, that B and C plane, or one and two plane, are pushed in the, are sort of squashed in the middle. If it is squashed in the middle, this will occupy that 1.5 position and not one and two. Then you know what happens, this is becoming six-fold symmetry. And that is omega transition. So now I let me tell you another term, which is not there in most of the uh, physics books or but you know, you must, many of you must have heard of the martensitic transformation. Martensitic, how many of you know in, the word must, you know, I know that, you don't raise your hands. So, but you have heard of martensite, martensites? No? Totally new. Martensite is very common and is very important even, uh, the, when the, uh, martensite is, a, the, whatever way you make steel strong, it is by martensitic transformation. You take it up to elevated temperature and quench. Uh, I read somewhere that originally when the steel was discovered and with that the weapons used to be made, they found that the weapons actually are hardened by heating it up and butchering some, some animal, then it becomes harder with the blood. Because you are heating it up and quenching it in blood, then it becomes hard. So this is the discovery of martensite is as old as that. It's almost in the Iron Age and that they discovered, mechanism has been understood only in the uh, late 40s, early 50s of uh, last century. So in martensitic transformation, it's called a sheared transformation. The one structure is sheared into the new structure. That is a martensitic transformation. Here is also displacement, but 
One interesting point is that if you look at the outer dimension of this crystal, that is not getting changed at all. So what is the kind of displacement here? This displacement is called a shuffle type of displacement, shuffle and not a shear. In a shuffle, external boundary of a unit cell is not getting changed, but internally you are changing the atoms in a shuffle in a new position and get a new, now you may say why it is a new structure. It is structure because you have changed the symmetry. I'll come to that. Now this can be also described by a, by a static concentration, static displacement wave. What is there that in this atomic plane, I'm now plotting the displacement as a function of the layer number, zeroth layer, first layer, second layer like that. And on the zeroth layer, displacement is zero. On the first layer, the displacement is positive. I'm defining positive to be upwards. And you have a longitudinal displacement in a phonon movement. So it's a kind of a phonon movement. I'll come back to that point. So this is what you're seeing. You can describe this and in this wave description, one point which is coming, that it is possible perhaps to change the amplitude of this wave. You can have a very small displacement initially and gradually you can amplify. So you are tending to describe the transformation as a continuous transformation. I increase the displacement with, with time or with temperature, what are some of the parameters, and then gradually you come to the complete complete. So continuously it will be keeping on changing the symmetry. You see it in this direction. Now I'm looking at it in this direction, 111 direction, and in 111 direction, it will look like this originally. There are three planes. In the cross-hatched is one position, the gray is the second position, and the dark one, black is the third position. And the fourth layer is again the same as the cross-hatched. Now if these two layers, this gray layer and the black layer, if they're squashed, what will happen? The original threefold symmetry around 111, is now becoming sixfold. Just these two become now on the same plane. The black and gray cannot be distinguished, they're on the same plane. If they're on the same plane around this axis, which is 111, you now find that it's a sixfold axis. So that is the transition. Very simple transition, only by atomic shuffle. There are complexities which I'll come to in a moment. So now, you can think of, again, as I mentioned that it's a, kind of a frozen phonon. So when you have a phonon movement like this, you have displacement. In some areas, you'll be having a displaced BCC. We are displacing like this, the same plot that I've given here. Here is a positive displacement, negative displacement, zero displacement. And which will make it that this layer and the, the collapse layer, this layer, collapse layer like that, which is omega structure. But if I reverse this, reversing means what? I just draw this upside down. So here is maximum, here we put minimum. Here it is zero, here is again max minimum, here it's put maximum, like that if you put, then this structure is called anti-omega structure. Because basically, if you think of a phonon tra traversing like that, you'll be having both this kind of structure as well as this kind of structure. But this one, look at this. This is no longer the two planes getting collapsed on the middle, but three planes are coming together. Two, three, and four plane are coming together in one plane. So these two structures are not equivalent, okay? If they are not equivalent, can it be second order? Second order requires this. These two structures will be equivalent to different domains. So just that argument was adequate to say that it does not qualify the landau lipschitz criteria. Apart from that other criteria also it's not qualifying because as you see, this is the uh, this is a symmetry of that structure and you start with a cubic symmetry, which is, which is this is not a, a subset of the cubic symmetry. Okay, so this is how one rules out that it's not a second order, okay? And uh, there are interesting things. There is a, it's so all second order transition, as you know that second order transition, if the TC is here, much before you approach the TC, the order parameter starts sh sh showing some changes. It's coming down gradually. So there's a kind of a, what's called premonition of a transition. Before transition, you see the system always senses that something is coming up, and so they know that it's coming up like that. In all continuous transformation, that is there. In case of a, a, transformations of in omega, 
what we find is that the phonon dispersion curves shows a kind of a minimum, but it is not phonon softening to make it zero. So phonon softening to not to this extent that energy comes down to zero. So basically that displacement becomes unstable or it is automatic. Any small fluctuation will develop to that. It's not that, but there's a substantial drop in that uh, frequency range where you would expect that to come. So what I have to, you have to again see that, what's the displacement, displacement, these planes as I drew, though I have written one, 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 they're basically two, two, two planes. And these two, two, two planes have to displace by two third, one, one, one direction. And that's what is to be done. And you find that in case of ideal omega, it is dropping down in terms of the energy calculated from such displacement, but it is not coming to zero. So there's a, there's a substantial phonon softening, but not softening to the level that it can be made into zero. Now I want to show you some structures. Oh, to keep a tag on time. This means 32 minutes left. Okay. All right. So now coming to the thermal beta omega transformation, the one peculiar thing is that if you quench it, you're not giving an aging treatment. If you quench it, you can get omega. But omega comes as very fine particle. This is a 100 nanometer marker. Each of the particle is typically between 2 to 5 nanometer. It's very fine, fine particle. The two things. One is that. And second is the diffuse intensity that you notice here. These dark spots are the beta spots or the, or the BCC spots. And what comes out are these very fine spots, which are omega spots. And there's a peculiar geometrical relation. That geometrical relation is that they normally come at one third the reciprocal lattice vector of the BCC. So from here to here, if you join, you find the one third position there. I mean, in any direction you go, you'll be finding these one third spots are coming. In any, any, any of these, these dark ones are BCC and the very faint one, and they're connected by some kind of a diffuse intensity pattern. So this diffuse intensity pattern, there were speculations, what it could be. What is this diffuse intensity pattern? Why it is coming? What is the, how the structure senses that something is happening? So we'll come to that point now. Now then that, when our microscopy resolution was not very high, at that time when we could image it, what we could see is that the omega is, is, is this block is omega. Beta part cannot be seen well, but if you see carefully, you can see the beta lattice. Lines are there. This is beta lattice. Here they are a little more widely separated in the omega. These points you can see. This each point. Now those who are not familiar with the high resolution electron microscope, a dot here essentially means one atomic position, but it's not just one atom. You are seeing a depth, the typical uh, column height, the sample thickness, is of the order of about, uh, say, 10 nanometer. So you are getting an angstrom deep, maybe about 30, 40 atoms together. That column you are seeing as one point. So it's not, don't uh, just say that this is a single atom, but it is actually one atomic column. And here you see that. And where from you are getting that? You see, this is like, uh, this is the structure as you are telling. And the collapse would make these two spots come like that. And uh, since the resolution is poor, these two spots cannot be resolved. And if it cannot be resolved, you find this as a, a brighter spot, which you are seeing within the omega. And this brighter spot spacing is larger. So even poorer microscopy resolution also able to distinguish it. So what you are seeing is this kind of a phenomenon. This is BCC structure. There is a, a patch of omega. And uh, obviously, as I mentioned, there's a fine particle, and it's like this kind of a structure. Now look at the diffraction pattern, where the spots have not yet come. But there is a, there is a kind of a uh, premonition that they're about to come. They're not exactly at all at the position of what, is, what I said, that one third and uh, two third position of the reciprocal lattice vector, slightly displaced. Uh, if you look at this, this line is not straight. There's a small displacement on all this direction that is what you see. And if you image it, what you see is that, because I gave the explanation that the brighter spot essentially means there some collapse has occurred. There's a kind of a shower of those white lines in this direction. Not very clear, but you can see some kind of a shower of white lines. What does it mean? 
We don't know at that stage. It, one of the interpretation that was that you have, imagine that the whole plane has not collapsed. But in, instead, in some directions, atoms have moved in the 111 direction. So collapse is not in the whole plane, but it is localized along some directions. And this direction is 111. And the schematic will show you that this is the schematic. Those crushed points are here, and they should be at around 10 degrees from 111, and which indeed is so. So this was the kind of an explanation that was given at that stage. It's about around 10 years, 10 or 15 years back. Now I come to another point. This I think many physics people will be interested, because what you see, when you develop this kind of a displacement wave, Imagine you have, a, as you have the areas of um, compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. It's a kind of a sound wave, phonon wave. If you have that, and if this wave length is not constant, or the k vector is not constant, but k to k, delta plus, k plus delta k, then there will be wave packets. And that is what is being shown here, that you have wave packets. And if you have a phenon, for a phenon like this, in wave packet, we have a region which is collapsing into omega. Just the next region will be collapsing to the anti-omega structure. But anti-omega is not a stable structure. If it goes to anti-omega, it's a phonon process, no? so it can always flip. Flipping of phonon is thing. You all talk of those things. I don't know much about this. But <laughs> flipping is possible. So it will flip immediately to the alternate structure that is omega, which is a stable structure. It's like a phonon which is moves, but if you have a chemical stability of, of a structure like this, as these atomic planes are collapsing together, it will get stuck there. So that is a stable structure. And then you have basically omega life de defects arranged in a direction 111. One of the descriptions is like a shik kebab. But you have 111 as a shik, and in that you have these pieces of omega lined up in that direction. And some evidences or poor evidences were there in the beginning because the resolution was not adequate. OK. Where do you get omega? In many systems. Typical phase diagram of a, of a uh, titanium or zirconium alloy will be like this. We have an alpha phase and beta phase. There's a beta phase uh, miscibility gap. And in that, a, a domain is there where you get, it is not a phase diagram because it's a metastable phase. In that, you get omega. In this area, if you can quench, you can get omega. You quench an age. Now I'm taking the other part. Is the omega transformation preceded by any chemical changes? That question. And it is indeed happening in some cases, not necessarily in all cases. So this is being seen as the, you can actually show that how diffraction pattern changes from, this, uh, this is well-formed omega. But much before that, you start getting this kind of diffuse pattern. This diffuse pattern changes, changes. Finally, it comes to the completely well-developed omega structure, where these spots are clear. These are the super lattice reflection due to omega, and these are the VCC spots. And here it is perfectly formed when omega is perfect. Now, why this comes? One of the easy explanations is like this. As I mentioned that, there is a correlated defect of one-on-one -on -one displacement of the atoms just in one direction. So these are, in uh, radiation damage, uh, the, uh, this concept is there. That sometimes the replacement collision chain displaces atom in just one direction. Crowdian, it's called. So the Crowdian formation, if you imagine that in one-on-one -on -one direction, and this is a loose structure, in that it is possible that in one one directions atoms are moved and there are singularities, one, one layer like the one row like this, second row like this. If a, these kind of defects are present, how it will be sensed in the reciprocal space? In the reciprocal space, these kind of defects will be sensed as a streak of intensity which will be on perpendicular to these directions. So that will be on one 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 plane. So this is a reciprocal lattice three dimensional construction and one 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 as you make, it, it makes a uh, tetrahedron, four one one ones, and it will be trying to make that covered double tetrahedron which is being shown. So these planes on which there will be a tendency for the intensity distribution in reciprocal space. If there's such a tendency is there, 
the actually what you'll see is a kind of a sphere formation in receivable space. Intensity distribution will be like this. And if you cut it, you actually get these kind of structures. So this means that we are at that kind of stage when we are here. It's not perfect omega formation as we see here, which is already in the dimension of about, um, say, um, uh, 5 to 20 angstrom. Now this can be worked out. Worked out by, because you can, this is the advantage of uh, the uh, first principle calculators, some of the giants of that are sitting in front. So, you know, they, you can, now you imagine that whatever I did, that kind of process can be done by the DFT calculation that you displace and see what is the kind of energy. So this is what is done. If you do that, first principle band structure calculation in the range of different, ampli different amplification of these waves, it is possible to work out that what will be the kind of energy. And the result of that I'll show in a moment, uh, uh, a little later. Okay. But I'll just come to that observation-wise. As I mentioned to you, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, whether there's any, any preceding process, like the, the, um, the, the diffusion of atoms and changing composition, this is the case of titanium 9 atom percent moly system, where the atom probe has been done. And atom probe, as well as the high resolution um, uh, head of stem type of a work, shows that there are some patches of compositional variation. The whiter patches are uh, high and low molybdenum containing regions, are brighter and darker regions in head of stem. So you find that there's a variation, both in uh, high resolution work as well as um, the uh, atom probe that we have rich regions high in molybdenum and low in molybdenum. I'm now looking at the same thing but in a little different direction because it will be easy for us to understand the process of this uh, atom position change. The whole omega transformation is this. This is BCC. This is a 1 1 plane is a uh, 1 1 0 plane. Uh, this direction is not 1, 1, 0, but 1, 1, bar 0, because this has to be perpendicular. So this is a BCC structure. Omega transition is this. These two atoms are going like that. Now, with uh, improved microscopy, it is possible to show these things physically. Let me try. Now look at this. This is a titanium 9 moly, water quenched. This side is BCC. These two blocks you compare. This is perfect BCC. Please try to remember this one, this diagram. We have a motif. This is a BCC motif. And uh, originally, and after the omega forms, it will become two more, two atoms will come in parallel to this line. This line and this line is parallel. The same thing we are doing. These two you compare. Now you see that they have displaced. But the displacement has not resulted in making them parallel to this line. There's an incomplete collapse, partially collapsed plane. About partially collapsed, it can be actually measured. I'll show you that what's the kind of scale now. Just in a moment. If you show that, then it partially we can see any atomic layer, one layer, two layer, and three layer, and that is being drawn here. They should all fall in the, in the same position in every layer. If it is perfect, then it will become in the same line, but it's not. There's a small displacement. And this displacement, you see, the, the maximum displacement is coming 0.2 of B222. B222, half of that is required for making it omega, but we are getting only 0.2. That means here the displacement is not complete to make it omega, but it's approaching omega. Here you find this has become parallel. It's complete omega. So you have also seen in the structure, clear omega particles have come. So these two things must be distinguished. And here you see that the fraction of D222 has reached half of that, 0.5. So complete collapse, omega has fully formed. So now between these structures, we are in a position to find out. And here it is clear that wherever molybdenum is low, that region is forming omega. So that correlation between the chemistry and the displacement is very clear in this case. 
Again, from the nudge elastic band calculation, one can get the energy as a function of this displacement parameter, normalized displacement parameter. And again, displacement here is being shown like this. And as you can see, that uh, shift of titanium atom is restricted due to the presence of moly atom. So one can not only see this, but energetically can argue that it is quite possible, not only possible, we see some, some effects like local minimum in the energy value. And that local minimum in the energy value, which is more clearly seen in the 3D plots of energy landscape, shows that there are points that where it can sort of get stuck halfway through. And that kind of a structure is also seen in, in the microscope. So beta to omega transition can be preceded by a chemical change. What is that chemical change? Imagine that Gibbs function with respect to composition, if we draw, omega is one line and beta, and most of the beta phase in titanium and zirconium have this undulated appearance because they have a spinodal in this, chemical spinodal. Spinodal, I think, is not known. What is spinodal? Spinodal is a phase separation tendency. Given a solid solution, typically a solid solution uh, wants to remain in homogeneous condition, but many solid solution has a tendency to break up into solute rich and solute depleted regions. And this process is again a continuous process without nucleation. And that happens because the system has a, a tendency for phase separation or the, the system is called positive deviation from ideality. They have to go back to school. Positive deviation, the ideal system and positive deviation from ideality or negative deviation from ideality. Positive deviation from ideality is that in a solid solution, if the A atoms and B atoms which are mixed together, they don't want, they don't like each other. They don't want to get mixed properly. So there's a tendency for phase separation. A rich goes in one side, B rich goes to the other side. Apartheid in human conditions. So this kind of thing happens in, uh, in and that is what you are seeing here. If the GX plot has this kind of a uh, undulated shape, that is two spinots are there, then you have two minimum. And so if you draw a common tangent, one region will be this rich, one region will be and, uh, titanium rich, one will be molybdenum rich. So that is the beta structure. So this is a phase separation which leads to finally having some region which is becoming titanium rich and becoming omega. Displacement is facilitated in this case by uh, the chemical composition change. There are also possibilities that even if you don't have a doubly inflected GX plot, but a simple GX plot like this, what is called a pseudo uh, spinodal, because you know, the, any crossing of these two G, GX plot is very important because this side, it can always jump from the structure beta to the omega uh, because it is energy favored. But what can do is that it is, it is actually happening. It's not as strictly the uh, D2G by DX square is negative, not that type of a thing. But even then, you may find that uh, you have a local change in composition and a drop, which totality reduces the free energy. And this kind of thing can happen. And that happens in, uh, again, phase separation without the spinodal present in that. Now you see that this one set, I'm coming to another complicated thing. Now I'm talking of a, in a quench condition, there's no scope of atom migration. In that also see, pure BCC structure, this pure BCC structure, pure omega structure because this line is parallel to that line. And this is a partial collapse, incomplete. So you have now is this structure, this structure, and this structure. So partial collapse is a reality. And now I can tell you that what we are seeing is actually a, a row of atom. And you can see this difference. See this difference. It's not parallel. It's inclined. What is the distance we are referring to? Distance between this center line and that center line? 40 picometer. No longer nano. Now we are talking of picometer distance measurement. In reality, picometer distance are measured. We know now this atom and this atom which would come in perfect omega to be in line, are still separated by 40 picometer distance. And it's, it's there everywhere. So you can actually show that the reason for all that diffuse scattering, reason for all that premonition effect that I've shown you, there's a, there's a basis for it, which can be directly observed. 
You can also solve that by, by energy calculation. As I told you earlier, that by normalized displacement parameter, this in case of zirconium and zirconium niobium, you can show that if you take a zirconium niobium, you cannot collapse. Because as you do the collapsing, you are going to the higher energy level. But in pure zirconium, in fact, in pure zirconium, the equilibrium structure is, is actually omega. Pure zirconium equilibrium structure is omega, and it's not alpha. Alpha means HCP. And that's what you are seeing here. This is what actually is being done. You are actually collapsing this as you are collapsing, corresponding energy you are calculating, and the resultant is this. Now I come to a, I have some 10 minutes, I'll finish it by that time. So this is yet another complication. Can we have a combination of this displacement ordering and a chemical ordering? There are examples. So the, it's very interesting that a structure like BA2 structure, which is there, ZR2L, there are a number of structures BA2, PI2L, they are like this. What are these structures? You look at this. This is exactly like the omega if I don't discriminate between the white and black atoms. These two planes are getting collapsed, but now we have a chemical order superimposed on that. That means from I take a BCC structure, if I introduce this displacement order, on top of it, if I put a chemical order, then it is possible to generate these structures. So BA2 structure can be viewed as a combination of chemical and displacement ordering. It's a hybrid. And the corresponding diffraction pattern is interesting. These, these spots will not, these faint spots will not come in pure omega. In pure omega, in 100 and 111 axis, you will find no additional spot apart from BCC. But here you are getting them because you have a chemical order present. In case of D8H, you have more because you have also a vacancy ordering in that. Let me not complicate it further, but you can actually show those, do these kind of jobs in, in the first principle calculation. Uh, and uh, the result shows different configurations are chosen. And again, you can see that only the BA2 kind of a structure as you do, it comes down. Otherwise, all other configurations are leading to energy increase. So this is only to show you that you can get BA2 and, uh, okay. In that, there are interesting things. If you do rapid solidification, there is a whole chain of reactions which are like this, and finally you may get this. But what is interesting is that, that these all structures are symmetry related. They're not arbitrary. You can see that how, how they're, this side is a chemically disordered system, this is a chemically ordered system. If I take A2, which is BCC, and keep on doing, I'll be getting omega. E6 by MMM is omega, this one. If you chemically order it, then what will happen? A22, you'll get B2 structure, cesium chloride structure. And cesium chloride structure, you do that, you'll be getting a whole range of things, and you'll get a D88. Or you do again a DO3 structure, these are all BCC ordered structure. And again, if you do that, you'll find that you'll be getting a range of structures which are all symmetry related. So symmetry tree construction in these cases gives us a, an insight into the whole transformation process as uh, reported earlier. Now some of the very interesting phases, commercially very important, commercially, see uranium zirconium, very important system. In uranium system, there's a phase called delta phase. It's known as a delta phase. Look at that structure, if you don't look at it, if you just look at that unit cell, you'll not get the sense that this is an order omega. But actually, it's an ordered omega. It's a, it's a, this kind of a structure it is. It's an ordered omega. And this is a C32 ALB2 type crystal structure. Zirconium atom and uh, aluminum atom takes these kind of positions as indicated here. And uh, you can call it a, and again, you can see that by having that kind of a configuration, you indeed reduce the energy and stabilize the structure. You can actually then ask the question to a principle calculation that which precedes the other further, which, which is the first thing and which is the second thing. We find that this is the kind of a, you do the chemical order first, followed by the displacement order. Looks like that. So the pathway can also be determined the moment you take the cohesive energy landscape. Now I'll tell you that why it is so important. It is important because I gave you a few examples, ZRCLNB, TILNB, copper base alloys, cobalt gallium, nickel aluminum, managing steel. Everywhere we find that ordered omega structures or ordered omega coming in. 
Only they are not looked at it in this manner. Yeah, unless you view it in this way, if you take just the corresponding structure, you will not see the sense. So, again, finding sense out of what you see. You see something and you should find a sense of it. So now you see the, the question of another interesting point. BCC system, it was again a fashionable subject in the 1950s and 60s. Anomalous diffusion in BCC system. You'll find some very nice books also, also on this. Anomalous diffusion. Why anomalous? Because there's a, a two to three order of magnitude higher diffusivity in BCC system. And second reason, it is non-arrhenius. Normal arrhenius plot is the diffusivity versus uh, in log scale with one by t will have a straight line. But here it is not a straight line, it's curved line. So curved line means what? There are many, many explanations which was given earlier. Uh, one of them could be that you have multiple activation barriers. Diffusion is a process in which one atom exchanges its position with a vacancy. And in that process crosses an activation hill. If this activation hill that it has to cross is not one, but several kind of activation hills are present, then it is possible to have a non rns process. In the omega structure, what we have now seen, because you have, you know, uh, not just that that collapse, but there are variety of structures like this, which is being shown here. I have one or two more examples like the configuration like this, which is there, actually you are seeing that. And con configurations like this, these are present. So this multiple type of uh, activation, uh, act, uh, the activated complex structures, when you talk of an activated complex structure, imagine that you have one atom has to shift from a position in the 1, 1, 1 direction across these 2, 2, 2 planes. It has to cross the the triangle of atoms and it has to come to the centroid of it. So that's the activation complex. So that activation complex, now you have multiple activation complexes that's possible corresponding to different energies. The energies of this has not been calculated as yet, but that can perhaps give an example, uh, ex uh, explanation of why uh, we have anomalous diffusion in these systems. So what I have showed you is this that uh, one on one plane of BCC stacked in this can change and give you the omega structure. And if you look at it, it is like this. And finally, uh, summarizing is this, that it's a first order transmission with premonitory effect. Generally, first order transition are not having premonitory effect. This has. Second is the ordered displacement of the two to two planes can accomplish crystallographic transition. Just the ordered displacement. You don't have to do anything more. Partial collapse originally proposed from the diffuse intensity distributions vindicated by lattice resolution images. And the fluctuations of solute concentration often promotes lattice collapse, but that's not essential condition. Several ordered intermetallics can be viewed as ordered omega, resulting from a combination of lattice collapse and chemical ordering. And presence of multiple types of omega embryos are responsible for anomalous and non rns diffusion process. With this, I thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. Uh, I'm sure you'll take a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a short question about lithium metal. So, huh? Metal lithium. Metal lithium. So it, under pressure, it becomes FCC. Yes. So I wonder if it goes through omega and beta phase. Please, uh, I, I don't think I have seen anywhere about this lithium. Um, on the, even on the passage of its transmission, it's going through omega. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Because if it goes to HC, it's like AB, AB stuff. Yes. Then FCC but is ABC. You have to see the correspondence. Sometimes we actually see only the overall structure. But uh, basically, it comes from the simple geometrical thing. Actually, first time when we did it, how did we do it? We look at the B82 structure and drew it in this one on one plane sequence. The moment you do that, you can see that you can derive at the lattice parameters of the product structure, starting from BCC by doing these operations. Actually, I did that on a graph paper. So you don't need any great science of doing that, but you can do that. So first of all, you have to understand the relationship between these. So it's not just, uh, but I don't think lithium is an example. Uh, at least no report is there. 
and uh, your multiple omega embryos yes does it make it glassy the sense no, in glasses no no it's not glassy glassy no because it is it is actually keeping its original um, Original lattice that structure of that the BCC is, is maintained, no. But in terms I'm of dynamics, that it is only in between two planes where there's a shuffle. I see. But otherwise, the structure is kept. It is not becoming glassy. Next question there. Hey, I'm just curious that uh, when you have this combination of lattice collapse and chemical ordering, what's the effect of temperature? Even your chemical ordering can be partial. Okay. Have the so there the can be yes. What you said is correct. Uh, in, in the, see the very systematic study has not been done. What could have been done is that you have uh, two ordering temperature. One ordering temperature is pure chemical and the second ordering temperature is displacing. I don't think we have that much of analysis done in these two, separate these two. And often they're a little mixed. One really helps the other to help. It's like a, there's a, a kind of a synergistic effect. But the, the moment the chemistry changes, the local, uh, the collapse becomes easier. That we have I seen. I think this is a simultaneous. Yes. Process. But simultaneous to exact, actually we wish to do that by, see one, one recently some experiment has been done using XAPS. And if you do some uh, in situ XAPS work, it is possible to perhaps uh, see the whole trajectory of the development and can talk about it. It is like, uh, um, spinodal clustering and ordering, they can come one after another or almost simultaneously. And if you can do some study um, sort of by in situ uh, um, small angle as well as diffraction, because you have to see in, in case of clustering, the wavelength is large. So you need to do that by small angle. And when it is uh, ordering, then the wavelength is small, then you need a normal diffraction. So these two simultaneously you can do. There are possibilities of these experiments. I, I was just wondering if, uh, as a, a naive question, this concentration ordering that yes. you had, how do you, uh, how do you bring that about? Uh, concentration ordering is something very common. Concentration ordering, um, I think the best example will be, uh, will be um, your dental amalgam. It's not pure gold. No, you have to make the gold hard. So you do a chemical ordering. And uh, so that's why the Cu3Au type of structure or Au3Cu, that is done. So chemical ordering makes it, uh, the, the nature of bonding is actually shifting a little bit from the metallic to the covalent. And it's used in, see in, um, another big example is in the blades of the turbine engines, nickel-3 aluminum. So that's all, you have a gamma, gamma prime. The, the ductility of the material comes from the matrix of the HCP phase. In that, you have very hard intermetallic distributed very nicely. It's almost like a geometrical distribution of that, the gamma gamma prime system. Yeah, that, that was what I did. How, how is it so ordered? How ordered. do you get that? Because again, it, as, again, it comes from a very simple thermodynamic fact. That is, there is a strong tendency in those systems to have it, unlike atom as its neighbor. So if there is a tendency, as I mentioned, there's a apartheid is one type of system where the mm. like atoms go together. Here, they prefer an unlike atom, its neighbor. And it's not necessary that the first near neighbor uh, dictates everything. So these days, the first principle calculation people, they do with many interactions, maybe up to uh, how many these days? Some 10, 15 uh, layers of the interactions, and then you can calculate and find out so it is possible to predict this rather precisely this is. Umesh. Uh, really nice talk, I enjoyed it. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is typically a displacive phase transition lowers the symmetry of the lattice. Yes. In this case, the translational symmetry is lowered. Right? Yes. From, you go from one atom unit to three atoms unit. Uh, but what is very interesting is you add a new symmetry to the lattice which is the six-fold rotation yes, symmetry. Yes, yes. So I expect the Landau theory of this could be very rich. Basically, the polynomial expansion won't completely work. Yes. You may need, I think, uh, transcendental functions within Landau theory, which will give you this uh, amazing structure that you recover six. Recover a, a new symmetry element new which symmetry is getting element. generated, yes. yes. That's Maybe true. we could. Yeah, work. okay. 
just about applications and where are all these things applied actually in okay. industry. You see, the omega, omega as such was not a very desirable phase. Omega phase was a, a it, it has a detrimental property, particularly in the ductility. So titanium alloys in which omega forms, it becomes uh, brittle. So it is not uh, desired. But uh, it is being applied in a very big way. You see, uh, it can be used as an intermediary. You create very fine omega particles in the structure and then give another aging treatment in which omega will disappear. But that will create a nucleation center for HCP alpha. And what will happen that the structure will be now very refined. So you can actually have a very fine uh, grains of alpha that will make the material um, both high strength as well as high toughness. So this is one application. The other application, as I said, you know, if you look at a, a, a region in the zirconium uranium phase diagram, a major part is the delta phase. Now, um, the genesis, how exactly this, see, uh, more and more we studied, we are finding that in any system, there's a systematics. None of these phases are coming uh, arbitrarily. They'll be all related to the neighboring phases. In more, more and more complex system, people are working. In fact, uh, there, is a, there is an approach called high entropy alloy. Here we are putting only two or three elements. If you put many elements together, that the entropy will allow that uh, new alloy to, but even in a high entropy alloy, what is being seen is that, that the structures which are evolving, they're all related structures. So uh, I think in nature, nothing happens very haphazardly. So they, that is why, see, what's best example is the turbine blade example. Turbine blade example is a fantastic example. You have a structure. Why this works at such high temperature? You're trying to work at a temperature close to, and with, with sufficient strength, at temperature close to 900 degrees Celsius. And um, the base metal melts at what temperature? Only 1400. 1450 or so nickel. But even then, why it is possible? Just because you have base metal, which is nickel, FCC. In that, ordered particles are coming up, which is uh, L12 type, that is again ordered structure, ordered FCC. And that ordered FCC structure is such that it is complete lattice matching. If, I, if you do that, you will see that the complete lattice is coherent. So if it is coherent, then there is no chance of that to grow, because there is no interfacial energy. Interface is perfectly matching. So there's no interfacial energy, there's no reason for it to grow further. So that will be stable. And so in most of the high temperature application, you'll be having a structure which is multi-phase, but all these phases are stable, and they are so stable that even high temperature exposure for a long time will not destabilize it. So basic principle has uh, huge applications. So uh, if there are no further questions, uh, let's thank Dr. Banerjee for a very illuminating talk.